My friends, welcome to the Word Exposed. Join me in contemplating the Lord present in the Holy Scriptures today, the 13th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Today's Gospel reminds us of two important things. First, the consequences that follow the choices we made. Jesus tells us, If you choose to follow me, be ready to carry your cross. Yet, we have a reason to be hopeful, brothers and sisters. Whoever loses his or her life for Jesus' sake will find it. The other thing is this. Generosity and hospitality are essential in our lives as Christians. The Lord tells us, Whoever receives you receives me. Whoever receives me receives the Father. Let us not close our doors to one another. Let us not close our doors to the poor and the persecuted. The books of 1st and 2nd Kings, although they're two separate books in our Bibles, they were originally written as one book telling a unified story that continues on from the book of Samuel that came before it. So David has unified the tribes of Israel into a kingdom, and God promised that from his line would come a messianic king who would establish God's kingdom over the nations and fulfill the promises made to Abraham. So the book of Kings tells the story of the long line of kings that came after David, and none of them lived up to that promise. In fact, they run the nation of Israel right into the ground. The book is designed to have five main movements. The story begins and ends focus on Jerusalem, first with Solomon's reign and the construction of the temple, and then in this last section ending with Jerusalem's destruction and Israel's exile to Babylon. And the story leading up to this tragedy is what makes up the center three sections, which explain how Israel split into two rival kingdoms, how God tried to prevent the corruption of Israel by sending the prophets, and how exile became the unavoidable consequence of Israel's sin. The book opens with two chapters about the kingdom passing from the aging David to his son Solomon. And David's final words to Solomon, they're very similar to those of Moses and Joshua and Samuel to the people. It's a call to remain faithful to the commands of the covenant and to give allegiance to the God of Israel alone. But David's words ring somewhat hollow here because David and Solomon then go on to conspire how they're going to consolidate this new kingdom through a whole series of political assassinations. It's not off to a great start. Solomon's brightest moment comes when he asks God for wisdom to lead Israel, and he even completes David's dream to make a temple for the God of Israel. Here the story actually stops and describes the design of this temple in detail, just like the tabernacle design in the Torah. There's all these gold and jewels and depictions of angels and fruit trees. It's all symbolism echoing back to the Garden of Eden. It's the place where heaven and earth meet, where God's presence dwells with his people. But no sooner does Solomon finish the temple that he makes some really horrible choices and the kingdom falls apart. He starts marrying the daughters of other kings, hundreds of them, for political alliances. And then he adopts their gods and introduces the worship of those gods into Israel. Solomon then accumulates huge amounts of wealth. He builds a huge army. He even institutes slave labor for all of his building projects. Now, if you go back to the Torah and look at God's guidelines for Israel's kings in Deuteronomy 17, Solomon is bringing breaking every one. So by the time that he dies, Solomon resembles Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, more than he does his father David. The next section of the book opens with Solomon's son, Rehoboam, acting just like his father. It's a very sad story of greed and lust for power. He tries to increase taxes for slave labor. And under the leadership of Jeroboam, the northern tribes reject this. They rebel and secede and form their own rival kingdom. And so now in the story, you have the southern kingdom, Judah, centered in Jerusalem with kings from the line of David. And now this new northern kingdom called Israel, whose capital will be Samaria eventually. Jeroboam also goes on to build two new temples to compete with Solomon's temple in the south. He puts a golden calf in each one to represent the God of Israel. The connection to Exodus 32 and the golden calf, it's all quite explicit. From this point on, the story goes back and forth from north to south, tracing the fate of both kingdoms. Each one had about 20 successive kings, and as the author introduces each king, he evaluates their reign by a few criteria. 
Did they worship the God of Israel alone, or did they promote the worship of other gods? Did they deal with idolatry among the people? And did they remain faithful to the covenant like David, or do they become corrupt and unjust? And according to these criteria, the author finds no good kings in northern Israel, zero for 20. And then in southern Judah, only eight out of 20 get a positive rating, which connects to another huge purpose in this book, and that's to introduce the role of the prophets, key figures in Israel's history. So in the Bible, prophets were not fortune tellers. Rather, they spoke on behalf of the God of Israel, and they played the role of covenant watchdogs, which means they called out idolatry and injustice among the kings and the people. They were constantly reminding Israel of their calling to be a light to the nations, that they should obey the commands of the Torah, and so the prophets challenged Israel to repent and follow their God. In these center sections for each king, God then raises up prophets to hold them accountable. And the most prominent prophets are the northern ones, Elijah and his disciple Elisha, right here in the center of the book. Elijah was a wild man of a prophet living out in the desert, and his arch nemesis was the northern king Ahab and his Canaanite wife Jezebel. Together, these two had instituted the worship of the Canaanite god Baal over Israel. And so in a famous story, Elijah challenged 450 prophets of Baal to a contest to see which god was real. So they both build altars and pray to their gods, but only the god of Israel answers with fire. After this, Ahab uses his royal power to murder an Israelite farmer and then steal his family's vineyard. And Elijah again confronts Ahab's injustice, and he announces the downfall of his house. Elijah eventually passes the mantle of his prophetic leadership to a young disciple named Elisha, who asks for two times the authority of Elijah. And what's fascinating here is how the author, he's recounted seven miraculous feats for Elijah, and then he offers stories of 14 acts of power from Elijah. Both prophets were clearly remarkable men, and they played the same role, confronting Israel's kings for idolatry and injustice. And ultimately, they were unsuccessful in turning Israel back from apostasy. In the next section, the northern kingdom is rocked by a bloody revolution started by a king named Jehu, who destroys Ahab's family. And although Jehu was at first commissioned by God, his violence just gets out of control, and it creates the spiral of political assassinations and rebellions from which Israel never recovered. Coup follows coup after Jehu, and each king follows other gods, allows horrible injustice. It all leads up to 2 Kings chapter 17. The big bad empire of Assyria swoops down and takes out the northern kingdom altogether. And the capital city of Samaria, it's conquered, and the Israelites are exiled and scattered throughout the ancient world. Now, chapter 17 is key. The author stops the story and offers this prophetic reflection on what's just happened. He blames the downfall of the northern kingdom on the idolatry and covenant unfaithfulness of Israel and its kings. And so God has allowed them to face the consequences of their decisions. The final movement of the book tells the story of the lone southern kingdom. And here we meet some very heroic kings, like Hezekiah, who trusts God when the armies of Assyria come knocking on Jerusalem's door. Or Josiah, who discovers this lost scroll of the Torah in the temple. So he starts reading it. He's convicted and he institutes religious reforms to remove idolatry and Canaanite influences from the land. But... Judah is just too far gone. The king, right in between these two, Manasseh, he's the worst by far. So he not only introduces the worship of idol statues into the Jerusalem temple, he also institutes child sacrifice. And so God sends prophets to say, the time is up. Israel has reached the point of no return. The final chapters tell the story of the Babylonian Empire coming to invade Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and carry the people and the royal line of David off into exile. And so the story ends leaving us wondering, is God done with Israel? Is he done with the line of David? Well, the final paragraph zooms about 40 years forward into the exile, and it tells a very odd story. It's about Jehoiakim, a descendant from David, who would have been king if he was back in Jerusalem. And the king of Babylon releases him from prison and invites him to eat at the royal table for the rest of his life, and the book ends. So it's not much, but it's a story that gives a glimmer of hope that God has not abandoned the line of David. 
So the question now is, how is God going to fulfill his promises to Abraham, to David? How is he going to bless the nations and bring the messianic kingdom? And to answer those questions, you have to read on into the wisdom and the prophetic books. But for now, that's the book of Kings. A reading from the second book of Kings. One day, Elijah came to Shunem, where there was a woman of influence who urged him to dine with her. Afterward, whenever he passed by, he used to stop there to dine. So she said to her husband, I know that Elijah is a holy man of God. Since he visits us often, let us arrange a little room on the roof and furnish it for him with a bed, table, chair, and lamp, so that when he comes to us, he can stay there. Sometime later, Elijah arrived and stayed in the room overnight. Later, Elijah asked, Can something be done for her? His servant Gehazi answered, Yes! She has no son, and her husband is getting on in years. Elijah said, Call her. When the woman had been called and stood at the door, Elijah promised, This time next year, you will be fondling a baby son. The Word of the Lord With my chosen one, I have sworn to David, my servant. Forever will I confirm your posterity and establish your throne for all generations. Forever I will sing the goodness of the Blessed the people who know the joyful shout. In the light of your countenance, O Lord, they walk. At your name they rejoice all the day. And through your justice they are exalted. Forever I will see. Of the Lord. He shall say of me, You are my Father, my God, the Rock, my Savior. Forever will I maintain my kindness toward Him, and my covenant with Him stands firm. Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord.
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, are you unaware that we, who were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? We were indeed buried with him through baptism into death, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live in newness of life. If then we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. We know that Christ, raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has power over him. As to his death, he died to sin once and for all. As to his life, he lives for God. Consequently, you too, must think of yourselves as being dead to sin and living for God in Christ Jesus. The Word of the Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. Right there, friends. Even so, we should walk in newness of life. Verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we should also walk in newness of life. So, Romans chapter 6, verse 4, completely uh, destroys this hyper-grace uh, argument of we're all born sinners, we're all going to sin every day, the blood of Jesus covers us no matter what we do. Everyone's born a sinner. The Bible does not say that, nor does it teach that. Going further, Romans chapter uh, 6, verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So verse 6 here, friends. Now here's another verse, Romans chapter 6, verse 6. This is what God calls you to do, to crucify the old man, to stop sinning and start living holy and start loving Jesus, knowing that this, that our old man was crucified, how can someone still be a sinner if you have crucified your old body? How can someone still be a sinner if you have crucified the flesh? Knowing this, that the old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died is free from sin. So, see, verse 7 says, if you have died to the flesh, if you have died to sin, if you have died to the world, you have been freed from sin. You cannot be sinning and be free from sin at the same time. You cannot be a sinner, be sinning, and be free from sin at the same time. The Bible doesn't teach that. It doesn't say that. It says if you have died to sin, you have been freed from sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Going further, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin, 
once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, uh, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 11, let's read that again. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. This here is going to convict you if you're a Christian. It convicts sinners, thank God, so they get saved. But this sign here is going to convict you if you're a Christian, because what does it say? For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And what is one of the commandments of God? Is to preach the gospel. What did Jesus say? Go into the highways and the byways. Luke 14, go into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. At the end of every gospel, what did Jesus say? Go into all the world, making disciples of all men and all nations, baptizing in them in the name of Jesus and the forgiveness of sins, and that they would be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. That's what the Bible says. So, if you're a Christian and you're not doing that, Jesus said you're lukewarm. Revelation chapter 3, read it for yourself. Now, maybe you're not feel like you're led to be a preacher. Well, I hear all these cliches in the Christian church. Oh, I have to pray about that. Oh, I have to ask my pastor about that. Oh, I don't know if I'm led to do that. Oh, I don't know if I'm called to do that. God already told you what to do, Christian. God already told you what to do. When you say, oh, I have to pray about it, I have to ask my pastor about it, I have to think about it, God already told you what to do. There's nothing to think about. It is only to do. The Bible says, do, lest you deceive yourself and be a hearer only. And James, it says, do not be a hearer only, but be a doer of the word, lest you deceive yourself. Amen. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who will give to you liberally if your heart is right. But it says, if you ask and receive not, it's because your heart is amiss, because your loyalties are divided between God and the world. That's why when you, as a Christian, if you pray, the Bible says if you pray and you do not receive, it's because your loyalty is divided between God and the world because your heart is divided between God and the world. And you say, well, I can't help it. Oh, I can't help it. I'm bound to sin. We're bound to sin. No way, friend. You're not going to sell that to me, and you're not going to tell God that. You're not going to say, oh, Jesus, I couldn't help it. I, I couldn't help it. I, I just, you know, the flesh wanted what it wanted. No. Nope. And if you're a Christian, don't even try to hand me Romans chapter 7. Don't try to tell me about, you know, where Paul said, Oh, I do what I shouldn't, and I don't do what I should. When Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit, he did not continue to persecute the church. He did not. So, if you're a Christian, don't try to hand me Romans where Paul said, Well, I don't do the things I should, and I do the things I shouldn't. Wrong. You're not going to sell that to me, and you're not going to convince God of that. Because the Bible says God calls you to holiness. It says, he that sins is of the devil, but he that is born of God sinneth not. It says, in this, the sons of God and the sons of the devil are manifest. And it says, to be righteous as the Lord Jesus Christ is righteous, for he who sins is of the devil. And it says, Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the devil in your life. Therefore, if any person be born of God, he cannot sin because the seed of God remains in him.
Do not think I have come to bring peace on Earth. I've come not to bring peace. But a sword. I have come to sow discord between a man and his father. Between a daughter and her mother. A man's enemies will be members of his own family. You may say we have left our belongings to become your followers. I tell you this. Anyone who has left home or father, mother, wife, children, land, for the kingdom of God shall be rewarded a hundred times over on earth and inherit the kingdom of God. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But if a man will lose his life for my sake and for the gospel I bring you, he will save it. For many that are first will be last. And the last first. So do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where it grows rusty and moth-eaten and thieves break in to steal it. Store up treasure in heaven. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. My name is Jairus. I am one of the elders of the synagogue here. My little daughter is dying. I beg you, come and lay your hands on her so that she may be cured and live. Take me to her. He's arriving. He's coming. He's bringing the man to Nazareth. Master, your daughter is dead. <laughs> Do not weep. The child is not dead. Only sleeping. Who are you to come here with your jokes? We've seen that she's dead. You haven't. Peace, Thomas. Peace. Talitha Kumi. Rise, little girl. something to eat. She's alive! She's alive! She's alive! In the name of the Father, and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Have you ever stopped to think about the motives behind the decisions that you make every day throughout the day? Your alarm clock goes off in the morning and while your body might be calling you to stay in bed, your sense of duty, your need to make a living, or your desire to be a faithful employee prompts you to ward off the desire to hit the snooze button one more time. Or maybe you're a student who's been given a reading assignment as preparation for class the next day. You could ditch the reading and spend the afternoon hanging out with friends. You could read away in fear of a pop quiz. Or you could read simply because you want to be a faithful student and make the most of the classroom experience. Or it could be something like one of those conversations that comes up at work in the break room. You know, the kind that spreads the latest bits of gossip about your fellow employees. Maybe you join in and add your thoughts to the latest adventures. Or you could sense that it's wrong, but fear standing out so you sit quietly by yourself. Then again, you might come to the defense of others and challenge the rumors that are being shared. Whatever the case is, all day long we make decisions. And most of the time we don't even put serious thought into the choices that we make. Rather, we simply allow what we value to guide our actions. It's at this point where Jesus' closing words in Matthew 10 can cut us not once, but twice. As we've seen over the past couple weeks in Matthew 10, Jesus sends out the 12 disciples on a specific mission to the people of Israel and calls them to live without fear in spite of the fact that they will be persecuted. Then Jesus lays out why the persecution will come as he defines the life of discipleship as one that involves abandoning your natural self, your natural values, the things that you do impulsively for a life that flows from the good news of Jesus. In other words, to follow Jesus means to adopt a set of values that will clash with people you meet every day. Clients, classmates, co-workers, friends, and even family. Sure, most of the time the value differences won't result in turmoil, but when following Jesus defines your lifestyle, your approach to work, how you spend your money, the way you understand your marriage, or how you deal with somebody who's hurt you, things are in a place to divide you from people who can't comprehend the gospel's impact on your life. So how does this cut twice? First, we have to come to grips with the harsh reality that to follow Jesus means that people we love might leave us. Second, it forces us to ask ourselves about the values that are shaping our own lives. And not just the things that we like to talk about, but the choices that we make. How do we spend our money? If we look at our calendar, where do we spend our extra hours? If we could look back at the choices we made and didn't make this past week, what values would they reflect? 
as we ponder these things and more likely than not find ourselves cut by the harsh reality that all too often we don't respond to the call of discipleship, sometimes even out of fear of losing the people that we love, there's also a healing voice of Jesus that we hear. One that speaks of the reward for hearing his prophets, for hearing his righteous ones, for hearing Jesus. Yes, we lose life in this world, but we receive life in the world to come. Beyond that, as we look at what Jesus values, if we look at his actions and how he chose to spend his time, we know that he values coming to those who are cut, coming to those who haven't lived a life of discipleship, and showering them with grace and the opportunity to start anew. Where in your life have you seen faith divide? When you reflect on your life, what values do you see as dominant? What aspects of your life do you need to lose? Almighty God, by the working of your Holy Spirit, grant that we may gladly hear your word proclaimed among us and follow its directing. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Hello everybody, welcome to our weekly encounter with the Word of God. When you come this weekend to Sunday Mass, we are celebrating the 13th Sunday in Ordinary Time. <laughs> I just want to tell you that when I came back to the Nativity Church as a priest, October 1st, 2014, almost eight months ago, um, in many of the meetings that I have with Father Peter, he used to tell me that Nativity Parish is a stewardship parish. And I asked him, I don't understand what it means, the stewardship means. So he told me a beautiful story. Also, I went to see Mary Lou, one of our beautiful parishioners, and she has been a volunteer in our church for a long, long time. And they both of them, they told me the same story. This is what they told me. They told me that it was in the Second World War, back in Germany, they said that it was a beautiful church and the church has a beautiful image of Jesus. So, you know, the guys, they blow up the church. And of course, when they came back and they saw the whole thing was destroyed, they found this, the image of Jesus. And the image of Jesus was without arms and without feet. And when the people ask the pastor if they want to throw out the image, he say no. I want to keep the image because now we have to be the feet, the feet and the hands of Jesus. And he says that is to be a stewardship. It means like a, we have to be the feet and the hands of our Lord Jesus. Do you know, our community in Nativity is a community of faith, a beautiful community of faith. We walk together, we use our time, our talents and our treasures to do the best that we can in our church. But now maybe our faith and our church is requiring, requiring, requiring for us something, something a little bit more. You know, to go also and try to reach out other people. That is to be the hands of Jesus. I don't believe in coincidences. I believe in God's incidences. And you know, somebody this morning came and gave me this beautiful image of Jesus without arms. And then I said, wow, this is God's work. And I said to Jesus, Jesus, you know, I need to be your hands. I need to be your feet. 
but not only me. me. Me as a priest, I do what I can do. But also the church needs you to be also the hands of Jesus and the feet of Jesus. We have to go and we have to reach out for all the people who, who they don't come to church. You know, many people don't come to church. Can be your neighbor can be somebody in your family, can be someone that you know, a friend of yours, and maybe we can just try to express our faith to them. And maybe these people are waiting for a sign. Some people are waiting for an invitation. And maybe you can invite those people to come back to their Catholic faith. Now, as I always said, please be kind, be kind, and be kind. Kinder than necessary, and a smile more, and we can change the world. We can make a world different just with a small actions of kindness and a smiling to this to the world. You know, people need that. People need happiness, and we can bring that happiness. We can be also the mouth of Jesus, smiling to our people. Amen. Our gospel passage for this Sunday is taken from the gospel according to Saint Matthew. We have been reflecting on gratitude. Gratitude that allows us to be selfless, to be more generous, not out of obligation, but because of this deep, this profound thanksgiving towards someone. In the first reading, this woman of influence, whom Elisha, had met and whose house he, as the prophet of God, had frequented, was you know, so free. She was ready to give up a portion of her house so that this man of God, this holy man, could have a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp every time he came for a visit. Why would this woman let go of such valuable space? Well, as an act of gratitude, as an act of thanksgiving and recognition of the goodness and the holiness and the selflessness of Elisha. Gratitude made her selfless too. In the second reading, St. Paul reminds the Romans that Jesus died so that we might live. He did not give us anything. He gave us himself, his life. He died so that we would die to sin. And his victory was not for her himself, but for all of us, so that we might have new life. How? How do we respond in gratitude to this person, Jesus, who has loved us so, says, then consider yourself dead to sin and alive for God. That's the fitting act of gratitude. In the gospel, the first part seems to be harsh. Jesus tells us that if you do not hate your father, mother, uh, brother, sister, your whole family, you are not worthy of him. If you do not take up his cross, our cross, then we are not worthy of him. Wow, quite harsh. But when you look at the total event, no. He himself took up his cross for us. He himself denied himself for us. He left home. He had nowhere to lay his head for us. When we look at some of the harsh, seemingly harsh teachings of Jesus, for him, for us to follow him, for us to be worthy of him, before reacting, let us first look at what he had done for us. And maybe rem remembering the great love that he has for us, denying himself, leaving everything, self-emptying, dying for us, then we know 
it's little. It's little for us to let go of ourselves for Him, for Him who has loved us most. Giving of ourselves to Jesus becomes a big burden if we do not first recall what He had done for us. Doing something for Jesus in the spirit of obligation, in the spirit of complying with the law or commandment, really makes it a bit tedious. It brings us uh, some sort of heaviness. But when we do it in the spirit of gratitude, as an act of thanksgiving, then yes, there is pain, but there is freedom. I can let go because I'm doing this for someone who has given up more than what I could possibly give up. He gave up everything for me. And actually, if I give up something precious for Him so that I become worthy of Him, I gain, I gain more. The second part of the gospel tells us that if we are a disciple of Christ, whoever shows us even a bit of kindness because we are a disciple of Christ will be rewarded. Look at that. And that is also our reward, that people are blessed doing good things to us, not because we deserve it, but because they see how we follow the Lord. Our gratitude to the Lord in terms of generous and selfless service motivates other people to be generous also to God. It is love upon love, grace upon grace. Jesus' generosity to us generating a response of grateful generosity from us. And hopefully people seeing that will be motivated to be generous, not only to us, but to God. Generosity begets generosity. Now, my brothers and sisters, it is uh, wonderful for people like me. No, we are priests, we are supposed to be leaders, but uh, when we see the generosity of other people, then I am put to shame. I am really put to shame. I could not believe that some people could be as generous as they are. And for no other reason than really gratitude. Not obligation, but gratitude. A few years ago, as a preparation for the Feast of the Traslacion, you know, the big feast on the 9th of January of the Black Nazarene, we received a report that there might be an attack during the procession to disrupt the procession. Call it terrorism, call it oh, some banditry, whatever. But the intelligence report reached us. There might be a commotion that might cost lives. So we were being asked to consider options, etc. There was a meeting of people who were involved in the procession, the translation. And I telephoned to them and I shared with them the report, the intelligence report. I asked one of the leaders, I asked him, can you secure the uh, safety of the devotees? He said, we will try our best. I said, are you not afraid? Would you consider shortening the route of the procession or maybe well, even making it uh, simple just around the vicinity of the church. He said, but why would, be, why would we be afraid? 
Jesus died for us. He carried the cross for us. And if we need to die for Him during this procession, we will do it. We are ready for it. I called the military person who gave the information. I said, you cannot stop the procession. People out of gratitude are willing to let go of their lives for the Jesus who had first died for them. The word has been exposed. Let us now fulfill it. This week, we hear St. Paul talk about the gift of our baptism. He says that we were baptized into the life of Christ Jesus, that we were buried with him and thus rise with him. And we rise with him to a newness of life, to a new creation in Jesus in which he dwells within us. When Jesus dwells within us, we're called to radiate that to the people we encounter. Jesus says, Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. We're called to be ambassadors for Christ, to be bearers of Christ to other people. So this week, I invite you to reflect on the different relationships, the different encounters that you have, and ask yourself, are people encountering Jesus in me? How am I bearing the life of Christ, bringing his joy, his peace, and his love to the people that, that I see each day? When we're disciples, we have to go out and share what we've received. We have to share that peace, that joy, that light to everyone. So let us go forth and bring the light of Christ to the people we see. God bless you. Friends, the readings today bring hospitality to our attention. Let us reflect on it in this episode. Hospitality is our generous reception of other people, especially strangers. It comes from a friendly disposition towards them. In the Old Testament, we see how hospitality brought favors from God. Being hospitable to the three strangers who visited his tent, Abraham was granted a son, Isaac. But we also see how lack of hospitality could lead to destruction. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah saw Lot received visitors in his home, and due to lust, they wanted to touch and exploit them. They did not listen to Lot, who pleaded with them to spare his visitors. They were not hospitable. Here we learn that being hospitable involves our self-understanding, our self-image. Abraham wanted to serve his visitors. I am your servant, he said. Hospitality is service rendered to the other. It was clear to Lot that his visitors were under his care and protection. Hospitality is my responsibility as protector to keep the other safe. We could also look into some events in the New Testament. The people of Jerusalem received Jesus well, even singing, Hosanna, Son of David. How hospitable, welcoming a visitor with jubilation. We are happy to be with you. But in the end, when Pilate presented Jesus and Barabbas to the crowd, what was their cry? Crucify him, crucify Jesus. They were no longer happy. 
to be with Him. Friends, hospitality requires commitment. I would like to direct your attention to the pressing concerns today. There are so many refugees, so many evacuees, so many displaced people. How do we fare in this part? Do we fear them? Do we accept them into our fold? Do we commit to serve them and to keep them safe? Or do we make a list of services we rendered and the goods they consumed so we can charge them later on? Do we forget our commitment to them in times of difficulty and inconvenience? In carrying out our hospitality to the poor and those who are persecuted, we can learn also from Mary of Bethany. Sure, she dropped everything she was doing because it was the Master who was before her. But I hope we realize that this event teaches us a vital element of hospitality, the willingness to listen to the other. It is not enough to simply give them food, shelter, and clothing in a mechanical way. We must also listen to them and their stories. I learned from my encounters with refugees, these people who were dispossessed of their belongings and were displaced from their homes, their cries for justice and peace are not listened to. Nobody bothered to look after them. They are made to feel that they do not belong. Friends, may I invite you to take part in the efforts of governments and the church in attending to refugees and evacuees who can only count on our hospitality. Somehow they belong to us because our Lord and Master was once a refugee himself. A good act we do to them is a good act we do to God who has always been good to us. Kind to 